as some would say. No one says that anymore. My mom might say that. But uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to yet another live stream with Michael and Evita, except for Evita's uh, away this week. So it's just going to be me trying to man the keyboards and have a lovely conversation with a guest that I'm very excited to have with me. Uh, I've been trying to get her to uh, to come talk to come talk to me. I said um, in that voice, which is probably why she said no the first few times. But uh, no, I'm very excited. Uh, it's uh, the lovely Marie Ndia, and uh, she is backstage. And I think without further ado, as the French might say, I don't think they also say that. But nope. Uh, very good. She's saying no. I'm gonna bring forward Marie. Come on out. <laughs> no, we don't. <laughs> Really? No. <laughs> so, no. For the, yeah, that's English. That's definitely English. Without further ado. No. Yeah, no, that's not from French. Mm -mm. Yeah, great. Well, then we won't say it. How about that? <laughs> How about that? Um, well, I'll do is I'll say welcome. Thank you for being with me. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited. I might have to do the internet thing because I forgot again. Mm, classic me. All right. Well, while she while she uh, makes sure that all of her technology is working, we'll say hello, everybody, if there's anyone out there. Uh, feel free to say hi. Uh, I will do my best to uh, be engaging, but also do this. She says, what's up? Um, and usually I like to, I don't know how Avita does what she does when she talks, but I always like to start off with a little toast. So I'm going to say, salut. Santé, I know the fail. That's Spanish, dude. <laughs> Compay? Nostrovia. Compay? Nostrovia? Chin chin. Chin chin. <laughs> Cheers. Mm. Mm. Now, mm, that's good. What are you drinking? So, I have a good. Child of the Caribbean, I am drinking a uh, ponche vieux or a rum punch with old rum, cane sugar, and lime. And I have a cup from my island that you can see kind of the, on the cup. That's Guadeloupe. Huh? And then if you don't know how to do it, you have the recipe <laughs> written at the back of the cup. Uh, how to make your punch. I, I like it very sweet, so I put a lot of cane sugar, cane sugar, but some people just put a wee bit of cane and a lot of rum. Oh, wow. Um, how, does that sugar dissolve, or do you just, at the bottom, you've got that slurry of, of saturated sugar? Because I put a lot of sugar, yeah, I got the saturated sugar. Usually it should dissolve. You should put the sugar in the lime and mix it. Sometimes you can also use cane syrup, so you don't have that problem. Makes sense. But if you use sugar, you mix it with the lime until it dissolves, and then you add the rum on top. And I bet, as a scientist, you would know the exact proportions, but we're not going to get into that. No. no. But yeah. yeah. It's a family secret. Ah. <laughs> I'm with you. Um, rum punch. Oh, that sounds lovely and tropical. I have gone the other way, completely away from the tropics. Um, but it is somewhat in honor of you, I will say. I'm drinking chartreuse. Chartreuse. Ah, oui. See, I can. <laughs> Specifically, for those of you who like uh, who like to nerd out uh, and enjoy the weird stuff, this is the 1605 Elixir. Uh, and that is, uh, as the story goes, I'm not going to give you the full rundown, uh, assuming you don't know the nature of this, of this drink. Uh, the Carthusian monks... Uh, yeah, it was like, it's monks, right? That's all I remember. Yeah. yeah. It's a bunch of monks um, uh, who were running around uh, for hundreds of years doing things, being persecuted, going into hiding, coming out, keeping keeping themselves sustained with uh, with drink, as, as monks are wont to do. Um, and they were given a manuscript called The Elixir of Life uh, back in 1605 by some guy. I could give you his name. Fine, you guys, you nerds want his name. The guy's name was uh, Hannibal Destre. Don't I have no idea what you're trying to say. He was the Marshal of King Henri uh, the Fourth, and he gave the monks this manuscript for how to make this drink in 1605. So uh, back in 2005, for the 400-year anniversary, the Carthusian monks uh, 
sort of making this and bottling it as uh, as one of their offerings. Um, and uh, they, at this point, it's made down in uh, Grenoble. It used to be made just outside in a little town called Voiron, Voiron? something like that. Voiron? I don't know. I have no idea what you're saying again. It's probably... French is not your forte. Nope. Uh, like, <laughs> it's many things. But uh, no, it's, uh, as you were saying, uh, off, off stage, you were saying it's very horrible. I mean, herbal. 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 Her her just herbal. <laughs> horrible. English is not my forte. That's okay. We all have our strengths. Um, but yes, yeah, so uh, so in honor of you, because it's a French liqueur, I say. I say Santé. Santé. Mm. So now that we got the drinking at least started, I almost said out of the way. Now that we started, Marie? Yes, are you? Michael. Where? No, I have, I have so many questions I want to ask you, but I, I want to start with how you got started in Lindy Hop, because I don't even know if I know your origin story. My origin story is actually funny. It was a gift from France for my birthday, and they gave me membership to McGill University Swing Kids Club. And I was like, oh, swing, I can probably do that. And then I went and I found it fun. And it was the lovely people of Cat's Corner that were teaching at McGill University, yeah. uh, Alan Wong and Lisa Cartman. And I was like, okay, this is fun. And then I started going to Cat's Corner to dance after the semester. And then I was like, oh, this is, this is interesting. And then I sticked around and 15 years later, I'm still here. Yeah, huh? 15, so 15 years ago, 2005? 2006, end yeah. of 2006, ah. yeah. All right. That's, that's when so it happened. It just, uh, so you were, and you were at university while you found this. Thing. Yeah, I was doing my master's. In? At that time, microbiology and immunology. Oh, bam, bam. Little bugs and immune system. <laughs> but I was already working on what would be the subject of my thesis afterwards. So I was already studying multiple sclerosis, MS, oh, yeah. as a thesis. And that's a thesis I've studied for the next 15 years. Wow. Almost. Oh, uh oh. You froze for a second. Uh, we're going to do a quick technical thing. Uh, let's see if this works. Um, we're going to take her away and bring her back. Um, and while she's away, I'm going to say hi to a couple of people. Hi, Ron and Cornelia and Jeden. Um, I'm saying hi to you because, uh, because not only do I want to say hi, but Evita is actually not with us today. So unfortunately, uh, we got a, we, uh, it's just me on the keyboards as well. So, uh, please keep saying hi in the chat. And if you have questions, let us know. But um, but unfortunately, Evita can't multitask with me by saying hi to you off uh, off screen. Uh, again, I don't know if Marie, we lost Marie for a second, so I'm gonna take her take her off screen and see if I can bring her back, revive her. She did say that uh, sometimes her internet can be a little finicky, and she just uh, she's just in a new place. So uh, let's see if we can get her back. I'm back. Hey, I welcome back. Internet. It doesn't like my room. It works everywhere in the apartment except my room. Of course, of course, that would be the case, wouldn't it? Well, you didn't miss much. I will say, when when we left you or when you left us, you were talking about how you uh, were studying multiple sclerosis. Yeah, exactly. So that's that's going to be that's what I also studied in my uh, PhD. Ah, okay. Wow. Well, my first PhD that I. Studied and then also my city that I, this one I came to conclusion with. <laughs> oh my gosh. And yet Lindy Hop was like, no, I'll, I'll keep going with uh, Lindy Hop instead of, instead of that, that doctoral route. Always there, always there. I started then and then it was, it became important. And when my first PhD collapsed, yeah. Lindy Hop is what kept me afloat because I was in a very dark place at that time because it was not ugly. My supervisor was very dedicated to ruin any chance I had to ever do a PhD again. Oh, wow. Yeah, she did very well. Because uh, my plan was to stay in Canada because I really liked it. 
but anywhere in North America, it works with Zephyr, and she would trash me every time I would have an interview. Really? Yeah. So you had moved, when did you, did you do your doctorate completely in Canada? So I, I did, I had one year to go mm -hmm. in Canada. So I, ended, I did, I started with a master's and I switched to PhD. And then that collapsed after two years. So then I was like, okay, I guess I'm going to get my master's and get out. Uh, and that's what happened. I got my master's, got banned for life from McGill. And then I got out. Yeah. Yeah. Something they didn't tell me during the process, but they told me once the process was done, it's like, oh, by the way, you're banned for life. Bye. Thank you for coming. <laughs> it's a very unconvincing to me, but. Who am I to stereotype yeah. Canadians? Um, so then, was it from Canada that you went to Sweden? I had uh, eight months in France before that. Because I was trying and trying and trying to find uh, a new position in North America uh, because of preferences that didn't work. And then my student visa expired. So I was like, okay, I guess I have no choice. And what was supposed to be a Christmas holiday back home became oh, permanently permanently back to France. Right. Yay! Mm -hmm. uh, and France is, I have a love hate relationship with France. I it's my country. I'm born and raised there, so I really love it. Uh -huh. But can't live there. Like I completely it's understand. So difficult to live there, uh, especially as a woman. So I was like. Mm. I was happy because I was staying with my sister. So during that time, and she was herself just back to France from UK. So we were miserable together. Like mm -hmm. misery likes company. Her nephew was uh, her nephew. My nephew, her son was very young. So she was happy with the extra hands to pick him up or bring him to kindergarten and all those things. So like it was, it was, it was good uh, family time, but morally and career wise and dance wise i was dying yeah so yeah. i was looking really hard for another place to be and then i had a friend in Uppsala who was doing her phd in uh, pharmacokinetic and she was like you should try sweden sweden has money you should try sweden sweden is good they have good university and she kept on saying that months after months after months and after a while i was like you know what I'm going to try Sweden. Why not? Since you are telling me so many times that I should try Sweden. And that's, then I tried to find something in Uppsala because that's where she was. And I found something in Stockholm and I was like, oh, I wanted to go to Uppsala. I'm so happy I ended up in Stockholm. Yeah. So happy. <laughs> Nothing um, well, we love you, Uppsala. But... Uppsala is great. Yeah, but Stockholm is a little bit bigger. <laughs> more people, more dancing. Right. Right. Yeah, so that's how I ended up there. Randomly applied to this guy. I was like, I just went on PubMed, which is like a uh, medical patient. I was like, multiple sclerosis Sweden, because that's what my field. Right. And then the first name I was like, I'm going to email that dude. I don't know who you are. And I'm like, hello, I'm looking for a PhD. I was like, this is not going to work. I had a position two days later. Oh, wow. That's so you're like, okay, I guess I'm moving to Sweden. <laughs> yeah, once they're like, we have something for you. All right, I guess I'll go then. It's, it feels yeah. like a sign, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It feels like a sign when some when that happens so easily. If things click, you're supposed to go right. Yeah. So were you yeah. in a like were you working doing lab work in? To, yeah. So, fun. well, you had classes, you had to have a certain amount of credits of classes and then lab work, uh, which almost screwed me over because I did all the required classes to pass the half time. And then I was like, screw classes, I'm just working. And then at the end, I was like, uh oh, <laughs> I'm missing a lot of credits. Take random classes <laughs> so that I can graduate. <laughs> but you did. You I did. I did. Do you want to see my thesis? I have it there. Uh, yes, we would all love to see that. We're going to read it. No, we're not going to read it. Wait, there. Immunological mechanisms regulating neuroinflammation. Yeah, and look. Oh, dear. 
I put Lindy Hoppers on my thesis. That's amazing. I, I had to sneak Lindy Hop in there. Why not? One way or another. Absolutely. That's amazing. <laughs> now, once you got your PhD, like, have you ever, uh, have you utilized that professionally since getting your PhD? Well, I stayed in my lab uh, for six months afterwards. Uh, well, because I was doing too much between dancing and working, I had a huge burnout in 2015, uh, which included memory loss. So I kind of forgot most of 2015. Mm -hmm. And then I had my short term memory was not very functional. Mm -hmm. So it took two and a half years to get it back. And that's, and it came back when I took, I said, after I graduate, I'm taking a year off. Yeah. That was my plan. But because we were in the process of publishing my, um, my thesis work. So I was like, okay, I'm going to take six months off, but I need six months off. I don't want to see a pipette. I don't want to see a lab. I don't want to see a cell. I'm out. <laughs> yeah. And that's what I did. And during that time, I, I was lucky enough to have quite a lot of gigs. So I traveled, I taught, I uh, went to the Caribbean to see my family. And during that time, my memory came back. And I didn't even notice until I went back to the lab. And I was like, hey, I remember where reagents are. Hey, I remember the exact concentration of everything. And it was just like things got back in place. Wow. So I really need, needed that rest. Yeah. On the bad side, during that time, all my symptoms started to come back, like the insomnia, I got psoriasis, losing my hair. So I was like, this is probably not a good lifestyle for me. I need I need to rethink this idea of career that I have. Um, yeah. So after that postdoc, I was like, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. But uh, now I'm on, on that one year break that I said, I'm going to take at least one year of break. Yeah, that's good. doesn't matter when that starts or ends really. When exactly. you're about, time is a construct. So yeah. Okay. And we're eternally young. Yep. <laughs> so, all right. So just a little bit about like just a little smattering of your, of your, what I consider your other life, like your science life. Coming back to this dancing thing that apparently you, you've uh, fallen in love with, when, because I, like I, when I think of how I first met you or, or saw, not even met you, but saw you, it was at Harang. Um, and I, it must have been chorus line stuff that I kind of most associated you with. Mm. Is that, how long had you been doing how did all that begin, I guess? Like, how did you get the chorus line stuff? Well, I remember you and Evita at Harang in your matching tracksuit. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That was... Like the red ones with the white stripes. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Running around with uh, comp competition and performance people. Oh, doing yeah. a, like, Rocky Balboa start uh, style of training. That's my uh, first memory. <laughs> Wow. Did you just watch us run by? or like... Yeah, I think you were getting the students to jog around or something. Uh -huh. I don't remember what you were doing to those poor people, but they were sweating. Good. <laughs> I, honestly, I don't think you knew what we were doing either, but we, we were doing something. <laughs> it's fine. That's funny. So how long have you been going to Harang? Like, like, when did you first go? Yeah, so I moved to Sweden in 2010 to start my PhD and I was starting in September and I was like, oh, I think there's this dancing thing happening in Sweden before. And then I started looking it up and my friend um, and like amazing singer, Nicole Rochelle, mm -hmm. who lived, lives in Paris, uh, was like, hey, I'm going to Harang, you should tag along. And I was like, you know what? I'm moving to Sweden, so why not? And I had my whole life in two suitcases and I flew to Sweden and I went straight to Harang. That was my first Harang when I moved there with two giant suitcases <laughs> ready to move yeah. to Sweden. Yeah. Uh, and it was a bit surreal because you arrive and it's like, where am I? But at the same time, I recognized the people in the streets and I was like, 
this is weird. I know those people, but I have no idea where I am. There's tons of mosquitoes. It's the middle of the forest. What is going on? Yeah. And then Nicole was in Herang because they were doing a musical that year. I don't know if you were there the year of the musical. I don't think so. I don't think. I'm going to say no. I don't uh, know. It was, and I remember because she, she was practicing and singing, and she was like, You should watch it. I was like, Sure, yeah, I'm going to come and watch. And Sky Humphreys was an angel with oh. like a wig and golden locks and a harp jumping around with angel wings. And I was just laughing. It was hilarious. That's, I don't remember much of the musical, but I do remember the angel Sky jumping around with golden locks. That was great. That didn't come up last week. I wish it was amazing. <laughs> His career as an angel, he should have talked about it. He didn't mention that to something he wanted to talk about. That's funny. <laughs> oh, that's cool. All right, so 2010, that, you're, that's your first, like, I, I'm in a new country, and I'm in Harang, and the natural response to Harang is, what the hell is going on? So you were, you were right at home. Yeah, and I'm not a people person. I'm not a tree hugger. I'm not kumbaya. So I was like, okay, okay. This is kindergarten for grown-ups. Cool, 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 cool. I'm going to take two steps back, uh -huh. and I'm going to watch you all do whatever it is that you're doing. <laughs> yep. uh, so it was interesting, but it was cool, because I was there to hang with Nicole, and then that's, I think that's the year I finally met Joseph Wiggins also, because I knew Joseph for years back because he had been to Montreal and mm -hmm. I had met him. But Josette, the day that Joseph came to dance at Gas Corner, Josette didn't come out. So we didn't meet. And then I think it was three years later, we finally met and I was like, you should have come out. We would have been friends for three <laughs> years now. <laughs> but it was so fun because like we clicked right away. Yeah. Uh, and it's been super duper extra friendship since then. Oh, they're great. Oh, oh, man. Oh. Yeah, the weekend, frozen sister. Yeah, that's cool. So, um, so did you, because, oh, uh, chorus line, you were, you like, on your resume of sorts, if you had such a thing, it would be, like, you were the director and choreographer of this chorus line situation. Yeah. How did that come to be? So, that came to be because um, I was hanging out in Stockholm at Chicago Swing Dance Studio, mm -hmm. uh, which is where a lot of the Harlem Hot Shots are teaching and also where they practice. And also it's it's uh, owned by uh, Leonard Vestelun, Sakara Slashon and Fatima Tefai. It's yep. their studio. And that's where I was dancing and also I started teaching there. And, and then I, back when I was in Montreal, I was, thinking of starting an, an old women's jazz troupe. Because mm -hmm. I was like, okay, it's cool. We, you guys are interesting, but we see a little bit too much of you. And I wanted to like explore different jazz, not looking just at the guys, because you learn jazz and you're like, oh yeah, Alan Lee on Shim Sham or Pepsi Bessel in the Tranky Do or Frankie Manning doing the Charleston. And that's all the reference we had in jazz, all the, all the brothers, Nicholas brothers, Barry brothers, Four Step Brothers, yay! I'm like, where are the sisters? Like, like what's happening with that? Uh, so that was my question, and that was my goal. And then Leonard wanted to have a chorus line because he was he likes to recreate traditional things, and he was like, well, if we have a meeting, it's like a theater or a nightclub, and in club they had the resident dancers, the chorus line. So we came to an agreement. He was like, are you interested in doing it? I'm like, how much say do you have in this thing? And it was like, zero whatsoever. I'm like, deal. <laughs> wow. And that's how we came to an agreement. And I started uh, working on like preparing the choreographies. And we had two shows a week for five weeks. So that means 10 choreographies for the first year. Say that one more time, please. Because that sounded crazy what you just said. <laughs> so I had to prepare 10 routines because we had, we had, we do two different routines a week oh for five weeks, okay. uh, which is, which was challenging, especially because I was super duper new, like choreographing, no, but choreographing to that volume, yeah. that was new. 
Yeah. And also, I had no idea how to stage things. I had no idea how small the herring stage was. So, uh, so tiny. It's so cool. tiny. We had zero costume budget or maybe like 100 euros. So it was it, the first year was fun. It was uh, it was uh, everybody learned a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Some would call that a trial by fire. Yeah. Plus that year they made us have the shows upstairs and downstairs simultaneously. So that means we had two teams. I had to train two teams of dancers. It was crazy. And if you haven't been to Harang, then the, the like on paper that alone is a lot of work to do. But in the chaos that is Harang, where where there is no free studio space, like oh, and by free I mean available. Like you can't find no. an available decent space. Number one. Number two. Even trying to get two other people to do something with you is such a challenge because everyone's there for different reasons. They're, like Some people are there to take class. Some people are there only to take the evening classes. Some people are there to just to socialize. And it's like all those different schedules and agendas makes it – it's like herding cats to get everyone. In well, we had a team, so I had gathered people that were going to be a part of it. So <laughs> – and I prepared, I had so much time. When I look at the first videos for, that I did for the group, I was like, wow, they were like titles and transitions. And the last videos were like, learn this. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Time disappeared. So, yeah, we had like prepared material that like things that I prepared and I sent over because we had people from Switzerland, Belgium, Canada. Uh, Sweden, of course, hmm. the first year, I think, no, it was not the year where we had Greece, but it was like France. It was a mash of, of different people coming together, but it was fun. We, we, we had a lot of, it was hard. And also, yeah, we were not acknowledged as something by the camp at that time. Cause it was new. Everybody was like, oh, that's Leonard's crazy idea again. This is right. just it's not going to last. And 10 years later, we're still there. So <laughs> now, did you do anything? I'm curious, to know, like artistically speaking, uh, did you, when choreographing stuff, did you go back to old clips? Did you have access to archives of chorus stuff that you could draw from, or was it all just from here? No, I, because I didn't know much. I had been, I studied end of 2006 okay. and starting choreography in 2011. So I've been dancing for like five years. Yeah. Uh, and I was not at all looking at original material at that time. Yeah. Because I was in Canada and you, in North America, it's not often that people look at original material. Maybe people are going to trash me on the chat, but that's how it was when I was there. Yeah. Great. <laughs> like we didn't really look at old clips. We looked at, our contemporaries. Mm -hmm. So like, especially in Cat's Corner, we were all about the silver shadows. It was like, whatever it is that they're doing, we want to learn that. Yep. So that was new. And Leonard did give me two DVDs okay. of clips mm -hmm. and modern or old. And I was like, here's inspiration, go. Chop, chop, give me my routines. <laughs> yeah. So I took a lot of time to look at it. And then to realize that I did not have the skills to understand them properly. Mm. Uh, and to try to do your best to take out what's happening and understand the relationship between the dance and the music so that then you can create your own routines, but yeah. ba like based on the, the idea of how routines were made. So the more I learned about how routines worked, and they usually have a simple structures, a three and a break, like the break repeats throughout the whole song. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's rare that they're gonna do things that are uh, at least in structurally difficult. Then the footwork, it's another matter because if mm -hmm. you don't have tap, it's some some routines you're gonna be like, I have no idea what they're doing. They just, their feet are moving and I don't know what it is. But once you understand, oh, that's a paddle, oh, that's a shuffle, oh, that's a flap, oh, that's a brush up, then you're like, okay, now I can understand what they're doing. Right. But it's that took years. Like, I'm revisiting the first routine that we did, and I'm like, 
why did I choreograph it like that? It makes no sense. Yeah. But that was a learning process. Plus, it really helped to have master genius Chester Whitmore uh, there for two weeks and to be involved in any shenanigans that he comes up with. Yeah. Yeah. And then you learn. Yeah. Because I was not just trying to survive the choreography. I was also observing him. How does he lead people? How does he create? How does he manage the space that he has? And I was just like trying to soak as much because I needed to do the same with my group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that was gold to have all those years of learning by being in Chester's shenanigans and being like, okay, that's how you do it. And like the best compliment I had last year was like, oh my God, you start to sound like Chester. <laughs> I was like, yes, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm getting better. Yeah. Cause he, yeah, no, I, I have had the privilege of just a couple of times being able to work uh, for him or along, not alongside him, but if they are shenanigans at first, cause you're like, this is, it's so, seems so crazy. And so like, what are we, but, and and uh, just like it's very disorienting, and you're like, I don't know what he's doing, but okay. Like he has that magic to kind of pull you into the idea, and you kind of buy in, going like, this is never going to work. And then before you know it, he's got like like transitions and entering and did, and it's a whole thing. And you're like, how did he get? Oftentimes with amateurs too, like with yeah. amateurs, you're like, how did he? Oh, and it's like the the last couple of years we've been collaborating on the big opening that you have on Tuesday night for the slow drag. Yeah. And uh, and so it's like usually it's a it can be a couple of numbers, just for those who don't know. There's a like a slow dancing night in Herring on Tuesday and before that you have a show, which can be a few numbers of people dancing or <laughs> whole theatrical pieces if Chester put them together. Mm -hmm. And the last last week, last year, I made I made it. Chester helped me with the choreography, but it was my project. Uh, and it was really fun because then, then it was it was I was like, okay, I understand a little bit more the shenanigans that it comes up with and the ideas that are there, and you're just trying to make them happen. I had to calm him down because it's week five. People are tired. They've been there for three, four, five weeks. Their brain is off. They can't learn whole choreography. So I was like, okay, don't listen to Chester. Just do the shim sham. <laughs> yeah. But it was fun. And uh, actually, it was really funny because people uh, were like, oh, this is Chester's opening. I'm like, well, actually, no, this one's mine. But thank you very much for not giving me the credit that I deserve for putting this together. Yes, Chester participated in the choreography, but it's actually my project. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Did you, uh, have you been able to get the footage of that from? Yeah, I have. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I wasn't in it because I was, uh, more uh, producing, but it was fun. I got, I killed Thomas Waterton. That was really great. <laughs> that was my, uh, I woke up one morning and I was like, I'm going to kill Thomas. <laughs> this is a slow drag opening. It's brilliant. And my sister was like, what? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're going to see. It. It's going to be great. <laughs> it's very, yeah. Again, if you haven't been to these, these, this thing, it's uh, usually it's a Tuesday night. So it's fairly, is that true? Tuesday night? Tuesday, yeah. yeah. Well, it, may, it might have been another day before, but the time I was there was Tuesdays. But it's, um, it's uh, yeah, it's blue. Like the theme of the dancing, the social dancing in the main space is is blues. And, and they have this opening number, which for the times that Evita and I were there uh, in the kind of the, I don't know, 2010 through or 11 through whatever. I don't know the dates, but... They were very theatrical things. And so it was, usually there was this whole story arc that, that kind of played out. It wasn't just, we're gonna put a number together that is a simple routine. There was there was a story, there were set pieces, there was lighting, like it was a whole, it was a production. So mm -hmm. yeah, so to put all of that together, and I do remember it being usually earlier in the week, which is hard because 
people have just gotten there. And so it's a transition of bodies and you're trying to like, oh, you're here this week. Great. I need you. Or, yeah. Or next weekend you do this. No, I'm leaving Friday. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Testing is a, is a huge issue with that, but that's really exciting. So, so you are like, you are a staple in terms of, uh, like an important part of that whole dancing element to the harangue production because of this chorus line thing. Yeah, now it's become more, I've been more and more involved with the um, evening entertainment part, which is under Leonard's, Leonard, uh, uh, Vestanon and Gunnar, I don't know his last name actually, Leonard and Gunnar are kind of like envisioning what's happening in the evening entertainment. And so with, I've been getting more and more involved. Uh, also, sometimes doing things at the meeting, some talks and and um, presentations on top of the dancing. So, um, yeah, trying to bring in some subjects that are interesting and and uh, not like educational for everybody. Yeah. So, like one one time I had like during because they had the chorus line track. Uh, to talk about chorus girls and chorus boys. Unfortunately, it was only women signing up. So we did mainly chorus girls, but Chester was disappointed because he had a whole chorus boy thing planned. Yeah. And it was like, dang it. And then he just recruited random guys and still did it because that's yeah. Chester. Yeah. <laughs> um, but during that week, I every day I was presenting a different female artist, singer mm -hmm. or dancer, a little bit of background, a video clip, uh, just to... Uh, Sorry, now it's my battery that's signed. Just to bring some some information to the people and it seems that I'm interested in anyway, so it was, I was happy to do it. That's great. Uh, I think it seems as if speaking of presentations and talks, you've been doing a lot of that lately in terms of education. <laughs> I mean, trying, trying. Yeah, it's been a lot. Like this past this year is a lot. Everybody can agree on that. Like, what are you doing? Hello. Oh, magical. Just changing life. <laughs> yeah, 2020 has been definitely an interesting year for all of us. But you, one of the reasons it's been uh, it's been so hard to get you to like nail you down schedule wise is because you've been doing a lot of other. You've been working on a lot of projects. Yeah. Yeah. Now it's been now I, like after the whole George Floyd story and the the demonstrations worldwide global demonstration against white supremacy and racism that happens not just in North America but also in Europe and in Africa and in Australia like there was demonstration everywhere. Uh, I was talking with um, two other instructors, uh, Felix Bergel and Michaela Helstein, and we were we had a lot of chats because I was overwhelmed, and especially I was overwhelmed, and I got a little bit angry because there was such a dissociation between my conversation with Black folks and my conversation and not my conversation with with the rest of the Lindy Hop community or Jasmine's community, but with. Uh, what was happening on Facebook, which is the face of Suggestions community, which was all about, yay, this is Frankie Mans, let's do the Shim Sham, everything is great, happy, happy, happy. And meanwhile, you hear, and this Black American has been killed, and this other Black American has been killed, and one more Black oh. American has been killed by the police. And you're like, are you guys aware of what is actually happening to the community where Frankie came from, and that you say you like and respect, and care for but you don't hear what's going on and i i myself had distraction i was doing the tap family reunion uh workshop which was online organized by jerry grant domisha sombrero Duas, and jason samuel smith and i was also that also was another ticking point because it's a it's a family reunion the tap family reunion they talk about everything and they talk about all the subjects in and around TAP, including police, police brutality, violence, cultural appropriation. It was just such an open discussion with everybody. Mm -hmm. And then I turned to La La Land, Jazz Dance Community, everything 
he's great, he's the best. And you're just like, I was just so angry. So I woke up one morning and I just lashed out on Facebook. I, do, you, I, do you guys even care? Yeah. Do you guys even care about what's going on right now? Are you aware that there is, there are people dying every day because of racism and white supremacy and you are doing a black dance. You are doing a dance from those people that are being killed actually mm. and, and discriminated against and pushed down. And it's like, like there was too much of a disconnect. So from this conversation, we were like, okay, we got to do something. And it's like, honestly, if you are, you are an instructor with zero knowledge of acti activism and you are the one that's like enough is enough there is a problem i think there is a problem right. like and we were like okay we're gonna create something and we created collective voices for change uh and and we were like okay we need more voices at least to start the conversation mm -hmm. so we brought in um ryan francois mm -hmm. we brought in uh Anaïs Sekine, because her, she wrote her PhD thesis on cultural appropriation and the the idea of joy in Lindy Hop and what it really yeah. means. Uh, and and Brie Mason Campbell was first advising us, amazing. And then we we're like, do you want to join our board, please, 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 please? And she was like, yeah. So we were super happy to have her on board. And Felipe Braga was like, he's super new at all of this. He's discovering so much. But he was like, I see the problem and I want to help. Yeah. Whatever it is that you need, I'm here. And so we started this. Uh, and yeah, it's been a lot of work. Uh, and we had our first workshop slash webinar um a few weeks ago and 200 people showed up and i think a lot of people were like we had a hundred percent approval rate on our feedback form like people were like it was great and i would recommend it to my to my friends and colleagues so we're super excited about like having having like started a conversation but now it needs to be picked up because we want it to be a true collective right. not us spoon feeding people in this is what you need to do but people starting a discussion within their own country within their own city within their own dance studios dance schools so that like we can have a global change on how we treat this dance how we participate in the cultural erasure that's happening the the appropriation and the uh like profiting of a black dance without any regards to black culture or African-American communities. Right. And, and also how in our everyday life, we are towards the people, the minorities in our own country. It doesn't have to be black folks. It can be other people. There's a lot of people from India and Pakistan here in London on top of people from the Caribbean. So it's like brown folks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and in France, it's racism against black, also Arabic people. So mm. it's like every country has its own flavor of racism. Right. right. <laughs> so to address that flavor uh, in your in your everyday life. So we're trying uh, to get uh, a change, a shift in mind and and having people on board to help us because with the what six of us, seven of us, there's only so much we can do. Right. Of course, but it's. Uh, I think what's great is that it's. Uh, a, it's a diverse group of people. It's it's very much a European perspective, but it's. Uh, but it's. Because uh, you're also working with the Move Together, or you were a panelist at least for the Move Together yeah. conversation, um, which was very much an American kind of take on things. But it's so important, in my opinion. Uh, to have a, uh, such a strong European contingent advocating for these rights because because the conversation in the States and, and Europe, there are a lot of similarities and crossover, but there are also very unique conversations and perspectives mm. from each uh, from each side. So it's really, I think it's really great that that you have the collective voices. And, and when it comes to Lindy Hop, 
and and the popular interest back in the 80s of linter yeah. like oh this thing still exists we want to do it now it's now it's valid again uh moment it's like things were happening in europe at the same time as in the us so like europe has a big role in shaping what lindy hop is today sure yeah and and i'm all like i'm all this is an african american dance uh from that culture and that is not into question but if we don't have that conversation here and there is such an influence a global influence of european dancers it's going to be really ha- hard to have a global change so it's true it needs it needs to be happening here and and from my point of view conversations were already happening in the states meanwhile europe was like but no that's america we have no problem yeah. our country aren't racist yeah. what are you talking about yeah yeah we don't kill black people here we just prevent them from having a job or a loan or an apartment but we don't kill them right that's the savage in the west yeah honest conversations are always hard to find regardless of where you where you come from mm-hmm. uh, just very quickly to there were a couple of people who have asked about um, they want to know about the the tap dancers that you mentioned as a as a big influence for these conversations um, just tell us again what what, yeah. you, what you referenced so for me um, especially because I was and I'm still very confused about Jazz, vernacular jazz, like when you dance by yourself. Because um, like Lindy Hop, we, I, I, I have a social experience of it because we dance socially most of the time. Like you could dance for competition or performances, but most of the Lindy Hop that you're going to do is going to be a social activity. So that was, to see it as a social dance was easy, but for jazz, it's rare that people would dance jazz. Just for the sake of dancing it just like they would dance lindy they would just jam and exchange and dance by themselves uh if it's outside of the context of a jam circle or performance or competition i i i haven't seen that so much but social dancing is part of tap dancing story like they will have jams and they will come together and they will exchange ideas and they will trade with musicians or other dancers so that was already one thing that I was like, oh, this is interesting. And and then you understand that this is part of many dances of black culture, except ours. I wonder why. Mm. Um, that you would have this social interaction in dancing by yourself. So that was the first take, like, okay, that's interesting. And then trying to understand those clips and understanding, oh, I don't have the skills to understand that. And what I'm missing is understanding of tap dancing. Uh, and also having black bodies. Because I mentioned Domitius and Brie Edwards, I mentioned Terry Grant, I mentioned Smith, Joseph Wigan, Joseph Wigan. They're all black dancers. Uh, another person that's been super duper influential and so nice is Michelle Dorrance. Like she's sharing, like we talked for hours about, we, we started, I don't even know how many years ago, probably eight years ago, we started a list of jazz steps and what was the name that she knew, what was the name that I knew. And like, she would tell me the stories because she learned from Mabel Lee. She would tell me some stories because she was part of Mabel Lee's course line along with some other tap dances. So it's not like, it's not like tap and Lindy Hop and we don't like, we're not like, it's like, this is tap and Lindy Hop and, and, and jazz. Yeah. It's like, it's connected, but we don't really reach out. Yeah. And yeah, you could say they don't really reach out, but we have very much of a bubble. Absolutely. I think so just uh, the, the, you mentioned the names, it's Derek Grant, Dormisha Sumbri Edwards, it's Jason Samuel Smith. Um, you mentioned also uh, Joseph and Josette Wiggins as dancers. Um, the first three that that we we talked about, uh, which was again Dormisha, uh, Derek, and Jason, they did a show with another dancer who's a she's mostly a B girl from what I 
uh, or hip hop is her genre. Her name's Camille A. Brown. They did a show at the Joyce uh, called and, uh, and Still You Must Swing, um, which I'll, I'll add that right there in the chat. And then I'll also add, uh, if you if you want to find on YouTube, they the Joyce did uh, they aired the show, but they also aired a talk back with the artists. So for those of you who are asking about specifically that, because I think you're referencing dancers that also have this this material. So anyone yeah. interested in hearing that talk back, um, I, I watched it live. It's really great and worth worth your time because yeah. I think it's exactly what you're saying, Marie. Like there is like. Dancers of that level and of that expertise understand the interconnectedness of all of these vernacular forms in a way that that not only understand it, but can execute. Yeah. They can do vernacular movements from our from our vocabularies because they understand the history and the interconnectedness with it all. And they have the lineage. Right. They can tell you who taught them that step, who learned it from who, who learned it from who, who learned it from an elder. Right. It's like, it's, everything is clear. We are like, oh, I just saw that in the clip. Which clip? I don't know. There was no name. It was on YouTube. Yeah. Which year? Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. It's, um, it's, uh, so I would recommend, and yeah, Michelle Dorrance, also amazing. Like just, a, just a, Powerhouse. A genius. a genius. Officially a genius. She got the genius grant. Yes, she, she did <laughs> her genius award a few years ago. Um, we, uh, Shannon uh, Varner, uh, hi Shannon, she mentions in the chat, she was like, hey, uh, she very much loved the Swinging in the Blues project that you did. What was that about? What was that about? No. What was that about? So it's, it's, it's the beginning of this pandemic ish and we're going into lockdown and again i wake up and i'm like i gotta do something i gotta do something to keep the <laughs> to keep me sane right and i have to do something to hopefully keep other people sane while the world is slowly collapsing I, especially for artists it's like our whole world is collapsing around us uh and i was like okay i want to do something cool 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 and then as usual, you always start with, I'm gonna call Angela and Drew. Hey mm -hmm. Angela, I have this crazy idea of, of putting together some kind of like quarantine routine. And she's like, yes, but change the name. Don't call it quarantine routine. I'm like, duly noted. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and then I was like, okay, okay, cool. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna think about it. And then I call Josette Wigan. Hey Josette, I have this crazy idea of doing this Quarantine routine, which we're not going to call quarantine routine because Angela said it's a bad name. Right. <laughs> and she's like, whatever it is that you're doing, I'm with you. I was like, great, we're already three. Uh, and then I was like, cool, who are the people that I've been working with this past year? Or I've been talking to, or I've been, um, yeah, who has been my inspiration uh, at that time? And so I reached out to then of course, Chester was the next person I reached out to. Uh, and then I reached out to my super duper friends. So I reached out to Dee and Josh and Latasha and Helena Kinini. Uh, I did not know her, but last year in Herang, we, was, we were a roommate. Oh. And she came a week before she had her classes starting. And I was like, oh, if you're bored, just join the course line. And she did. She practiced with us and she did the number and she's just a fantastic dancer and so such a nice person. So I was like, okay, yeah, Helena, I really like her and she's cool and we we, we got along well. And then um, I think it was since December, or like I've been chatting with Ryan, Ryan Francois, uh, and then we had, a, we had, we were supposed to just meet for a coffee and it ended up being, almost seven hours talk <laughs> uh, and, and and from that talk we were like okay we want to to get to know each other better and and start to collaborate with each other which was great uh so i was like well here is a collaboration uh, i did reach out to other people who couldn't or were busy or didn't answer so um that ended up being the the people that were there and 
uh, Chester was like, you need uh, you need a reoccurring break. I was like, yeah, that makes sense because usually it's a break in those classic routines. It stays the whole time. You don't really change the break. You're going to play with it, but it's going to be the same break. So, yeah. So I was like, okay, I'm going to try to make a break and I'm going to start this thing. And then I distributed the parts uh, to everybody. Okay. And I'm like, from this second to this second, I, I just like made it, made it super clear so that people had minimum because everybody was busy to try and figure out how they were going to survive. So I was like, yeah. here's your part. Here's the thing. Here's the break. Here are the videos. If you can send them to me, if you don't have them to edit, I can do it. I was like trying to make things as easy as possible for for everybody. And yeah, and then we we did it. Uh, and I'm super excited about this routine. I think it was super fun. I was excited about learning all the steps. Yeah. I mean, and that's the like the beauty of it from a selfish standpoint is like it forces you to learn new stuff anyway and then you get to like put it out to the world which is great like it's a great excuse to learn yeah and that kept me busy for like four weeks so i was like yay <laughs> is that something that is can people still access any of that material yeah all of it is on my um like the videos you can see them on my instagram oh my on facebook if you use the hashtag swinging the blues uh -huh, uh -huh. um then uh, you can um you can see the you will see the videos the progression and i always say this is the first part and part three and four and uh, i also announced the the people that were in there I, the idea was to put it together eventually i'll put it together and put it on my website uh, but i haven't hey. done it hey. yet <laughs> We still have time. That's the good. The good news is we're not running out to go anywhere dancing anytime soon. So you still have time. <laughs> exactly. Fine. Um, and that was actually a perfect. I didn't mean for that to to be a perfect tie-in, but uh, I am putting on display there uh, your social media, which is your website. Um, and I give. I still get a little uh, like it gives me a little bit of like to try to say your last name because I've never actually asked you. Ndia. No. Ndia. It's very easy. You say the you say the first three letters of my last name. India. Now you say the letters. N D I A. Now just the first three. N D. N D I. N D I. -A. I, also, I can't read. I was like, what are the first three letters? That's it. N D I, and that's it. <laughs> that's perfect. Um, yeah. So read N D I dot com. Yeah. Instagram handle right there at Marie swing jazz dance so i should have added more on the instagram make it even longer because that's like it's too short I start a new one just start a new hand that's fine but yeah just for everyone out there uh please go check out these two resources to stay in in contact with her because uh i i feel like um thanks shannon she's like i love the way it unfolded as well um well, professional not <laughs> Um, I do want to be mindful of your time because I know that you have another uh, another meeting, another Zoom meeting, like so many of us have Zoom meetings. That's all we do now. It's an exciting one. It's for the new fund, uh, the African and African Diasporic Linda Hoppers Fund, which is going to be renamed very soon because that's a mouthful. Uh, so, and that's a new project, another hat to wear. Uh, and it's uh, super exciting to be a part of this and to see where this is going. Is there any other uh, any other tip? Like that was a mouthful. Just very quickly, the the the, the what we call the Cliff's Notes version. That's a very American reference, I think. But what is the short? What is this fund again? The 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 short version is going to be the Black Lindy Hoppers Fund. Amazing. To and the point. And to, yeah, very succinct and right. <laughs> and this fund will hopefully do what? Well, the idea is to have what is lacking for black dancers in the jazz dance community and in the help community, which is uh, support and opportunity. Mm -hmm. So the goal is to offer that as well as a community, a place to meet people, to get in contact, mentorship, 
um, and hopefully to develop that so that when the the global jazz dance community has embraced change, collective yeah. voices for change, and uh, has made a space where everybody and truly everybody can be together and not be ostracized or otherized. Is that a word? I just made it up. We'll go with it. It's other, word. I think otherized. Otherized. Yeah, otherized. Yeah, yeah, that's a word now. Yeah. So and and then there like there is a space for all those amazing black dancers to be mm -hmm. and to share and to be a part of, truly a part of. That's great. That's very exciting. But from my understanding, it's still very much in its infancy. So we don't have, unfortunately, we don't have a website yet to send people to. Um, I don't think I, I no, tried I, one earlier, but I was like, it's not complete. So I'm no, it's it's very 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 new. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's uh, it's getting there. It's getting there soon. Right. There will be uh, an, an official announcement because uh, it's it's a project supported by the Frankie Manning Foundation. Right. which I'm also on the board of mm -hmm. <laughs> since mm -hmm. a few weeks. So um, so that's like, those are, it's a sister project. So it's going to be um, following the helpers, filing the helpers, uh, and to have a more more integrated dance community. So it's all for the best. Yeah, that's amazing. That was the less successful Damon Dash clothing line by us, by the way. For Lindy Hoppers by Lindy, no, it's a weird, that's just dumb, it's a dumb joke. He had a, 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 a clothing line for us by us, FUBU. For Lindy Hoppers by Lindy Hoppers, I love it. I think it's great. Ah, I, I'm starting to understand the joke. It's not a worth it. It's not a worth it. Bit. Um, like I said, I do want to be very mindful of your time so that you have the ability to get to that next call. But I, before I let you go, I just want to say, first of all, thank you. This is great. Thanks for having me. So lovely. And for everyone out there who was watching, thank you as well for participating, uh, either through the chat or just by passively watching. Um, hopefully, you got a, a chance to learn a little bit more about this lovely, beautiful person on the other side of the screen. And, um, and again, if you uh, are interested in staying in contact with her, this is her social media as well. So you can, you can find her either at her website or uh, on her Instagram. And, uh, and again, she's well, she's running, or, or she's a big part of this, the Collective Voices for Change. You can find them on Facebook for the moment, but I also assume they'll get a website. Yeah, under construction. Yeah, it takes time, these things. So mm -hmm. please, uh, please give all the love to Marie. Thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. And, uh, and hopefully you stay safe out there, wherever you are in the world. And, uh, and with that, I say a good night. Cheers. Yeah. Oh, yes. Final. Yeah, it's the end. Chin -chin, the end. Let's finish it. Here we go. Lovely. Thanks, Marie. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye.